today uh, I want to talk about scalable and extendable data pipelines, uh, specifically in the context of uh, online games, well, uh, in my case, uh, Call of Duty series. So in Activision, uh, we have a few central data teams, uh, but from a very high-level perspective, and I, I want to repeat, very high-level perspective, this is what our data pipeline looks like. Uh, we collect various telemetry from uh, game consoles and backend services. Uh, then we have this big pipe in the middle, which consists from data lake, various Kafka clusters, consumers, producers, stream and batch processors. Uh, we apply a bunch of ETL transformations, and in the end, we write all this to a data warehouse. So it's a pretty standard data pipeline. Um, a few numbers for you to understand the scale we're dealing with. Uh, we have petabytes of uh, files in our data lake. Uh, we have uh, many hundreds of uh, topics in our largest Kafka cluster. Uh, and we process uh, tens of thousands of messages per second, but this number is interesting because it's uh, growing, al always growing, and uh, the message size varies from 200 bytes to 20 kilobytes, so it's, it's very different. And uh, you can think these are relatively uh, big numbers, but I'm here today, I, I don't want to talk about scaling the pipeline in terms of volume or messages per second. Uh, I actually uh, think that this dimension is the easiest for scaling, right? Because if you need to scale your pipeline in terms of volume or traffic, uh, you can use all the best practices, all the guidelines available online, uh, learn from the industry. So I think it's actually the easiest uh, way to scale. Uh, in our case, we also need to scale our pipeline in terms of number of games we support because uh, we rarely retire games and we launch a new game every year, right? So we, we, should, we should build this data platform that's capable of uh, supporting uh, many, many games going forward. And this is challenging because every new game is different and we can use some previous experience uh, from our previous games uh, and we can maybe do some capacity planning, but again, every new game is really different, so it's, it's harder. Uh, and finally, use cases. What I mean with use case, uh, any kind of new feature, new request, some ad hoc request, um, and some of them are gonna be really straightforward, like some, some custom report or something, and some of them, like uh, GDPR compliance, for example, is really, really challenging uh, to implement, right? So we also need to be able to extend the pipeline uh, in terms of all these use cases. And I want to say a few words about Kafka, because Kafka is actually a foundation of our platform. So if you're not familiar with Kafka, it's very similar to a bunch of other messaging solutions out there, like RabbitMQ or ActiveMQ. But it was designed uh, to be a distributed system, highly scalable, so all the topics in Kafka are partitioned and replicated. Uh, which means as a consumer or producer of data, uh, you would need to either consume from all the partitions at the same time, uh, probably in parallel, or produce data to all these partitions, maybe in a round-robin fashion. And so when we start thinking about scaling the data pipeline in terms of number of games we support, uh, the number of topics and partitions uh, suddenly start to matter a lot. Well, as a general rule, I think you can agree that uh, you know, we would like to keep the number of topics and partitions low in this case, just because it's less servers to maintain, less resources to have, so less ops work to do, sure. Uh, at the same time, number of partitions in a fixed Kafka cluster is not infinite. You cannot just keep adding new topics and new partitions all the time. Uh, there's no hard limit, but eventually you're gonna reach soft limit uh, which you can calculate uh, if you find some, some articles online. And in this case, the latency in your cluster starts to go higher. Of course, you want to avoid that. Uh, and and uh, also scaling uh, Kafka is hard because when you have terabytes of data per node and you add another one, it can take days uh, for that data to be fully replicated, right? And because of that, auto-scaling Kafka is pretty much impossible. Yeah, uh, so why is it a problem for us? Well, uh, surprisingly, because of our topic naming convention. To be honest, it's still pretty much Wild West nowadays with Kafka. Uh, there are no good practices, uh, very few guidelines available online how, how we're supposed to name your topics in Kafka. So a couple of years ago, when we designed this uh, pipeline, we came up with this convention. So most of the topics, they start with the environment. Something like production, testing, staging, pretty standard. Uh, then we have a source, so that's a producer of data, uh, usually a service. 
Uh, then we have a title. So title is a unique game ID, uh, which literally means something like Call of Duty World War II on PlayStation Network. Uh, then we have a category of data and the protocol version. So as an example, you can see here uh, a topic with telemetry match events, or we can call them uh, match summaries. So when, when an online uh, match is finished, we generate this event with the uh, player information, various statistics, how many kills, how many shots, all this. Uh, and we actually send this uh, event to this topic, and you can also see we will have some sort of uh, unique ID, um, a message, uh, excuse me, the service name, and the environment as well. And this convention is really inefficient, if you think about it. Because what happens when you launch a new game, now you need to add a bunch of new titles, right? Because we support a lot of different platforms, we have a lot of various flavors of environments, so you end up with a lot of new titles. For uh, most of the titles, you need to introduce multiple environments. Uh, you will definitely introduce new services, new producers of data, and you will definitely introduce new categories of data because, as I said, every game is different and we uh, always add new instrumentation, we always collect new uh, telemetry types, right? So when you multiply all these variables, you quickly get combinatorial explosion of all these different combinations you need to support. Um, and this is not fun because you end up creating hundreds of new topics and many, many thousands of new partitions. And the worst part here, um, they are not really used efficiently, all these new partitions. Uh, because uh, first of all, uh, we actually allow producers to generate topics on demand. Uh, so we have uh, auto topic creation enabled and we have a double digit number uh, set as a default number of partitions, right? So, which means um, every, every new uh, environment, every new title will create a new topic and uh, because we have a, the same number of partitions for all of them, let's say 50, for production scale topic, it's gonna be fine, right? Uh, you need this number of partitions to scale efficiently, to be able to consume all the data, but for development or testing, maybe you only need five partitions, maybe even two, right? But we don't control it because we just allow producers to generate all these partitions. So it's really inefficient. Um, what kind of solution you can apply here? Uh, there are a few different ways you can fix it, but I think uh, a proper solution actually has been invented many decades ago. Just think about databases, really, because messaging a system like Kafka is a form of a database and when you need to understand how would you name a topic or what are you supposed to write in a, in a topic, you can think about a database uh, name and a table name in like relational perspective or more generically, some sort of namespace and a data type, right? So let's see, if we apply this new convention to um, topics we have, uh, on the left side you see all the existing uh, topic names on the right side, uh, this new proposed convention. So uh, quickly you can understand, yeah, it looks really straightforward. I can, I can totally read it and understand what it, what it contains, right? So it's, uh, it's very precise. It's just the data type you want. Uh, at the same time, obviously, there are pros and cons everywhere. And so um, with the existing approach, it's really easy to monitor all these data streams, right? Because you have all this metadata right in the topic name. So you can use built-in Kafka metrics if you want to, and you will immediately understand you know, how all your data streams behave, you know, what is the number of requests per second on specific title or environment. So it's, it's great, it's really easy to do. And as a consumer, you can also consume a, a very precise data stream you want. Maybe you're building a very specific dashboard and you're only interested in a very specific title uh, and a very specific environment of that title, so we can consume that. Uh, but you also need to understand that all these dynamic fields, all this metadata, uh, it, can, it will change, right? Because we introducing new services, we can deprecate uh, titles and various other things. So these dynamic fields, they, they are not static. Uh, and with the new approach, you actually get a really nice utilization of all these partitions, right? So you don't need to create you know, uh, many hundreds of new partitions all the time. So your utilization is really great, and this is something we really want to uh, have because we don't want to scale Kafka all the time, right? 
And finally, uh, it's impossible to enforce anything with this topic naming convention because, well, uh, even if you name something production data stream, uh, you will eventually misconfigure something and you will end up with dev data in a production and uh, production data in development uh, topic easily. All right, so we should not really do that. So assuming for now we're going to stick uh, with this new approach, you know, what is the next change we should do? Uh, and if we decide to implement it, we realize that after removing all this necessary metadata from the topic names, now we need to introduce some sort of stream processing layer in our uh, system. Uh, what I mean with stream processing, uh, simply consuming all the data from all your data streams, doing something useful with it, and writing it back to Kafka, probably to a new topic. So why, why do we need it? Because now uh, we don't have really good visibility at what's going on with our data streams. So we need to measure, we need to monitor all these different dimensions, right? We need to understand, again, how many requests uh, per second we have for this title or this environment. So it's actually really easy to do when you have a stream processing system because you just consume all the messages, you measure uh, all the rates, and then you report them to your monitoring system of choice. Uh, you can also apply some very lightweight validation and enrichment if you want, uh, but it should not be treated as ETL, right? It's not ETL, it's just a very lightweight operational uh, stream processing, right? You're not gonna really look at your domain uh, events and apply any business logic here. Uh, finally, filtering and routing is really important because the moment you introduce this new way of uh, uh, routing data and consuming data, uh, any consumer will come to you and say, I don't want to consume all this data from all these different environments and titles. Uh, it's a lot of data. It's really expensive for me to do it. So can you just give me that old way of only getting a specific title from a specific environment? Um, and sure, you, you will probably answer yes, because you know, it, it is expensive for uh, many consumers to do that. But you should build a, a generic way to do that. So your stream processing layer should be able to filter uh, a data stream and route it to a new topic, maybe permanently, maybe just for a few days, and then you can terminate it. But you should build it in your own uh, stream processing layer. You shouldn't force consumers to always do that. And it should still be an exception, right? You should still try to stick to existing convention uh, to the new one I showed, uh, but as an exception, sure, sometimes you have to agree, yes, I need to expose this data stream as a new topic, so shouldn't be a problem. We actually built this um, stream processing layer uh, on top of Kafka streams, and internally it's called uh, Refinery. So then, uh, when you do that, you also realize that having a single uh, message schema for a topic now is, just, is more than uh, nice to have. And what do I mean? Uh, we are a central data team, and we have a lot of different producers, right? So we have multiple different game studios sending data to us. We have a bunch of backend developers. So we actually deal with a lot of different message formats, like different versions of Protobuf, CSV, JSON. Internally, we use Avro, Parquet, all these different formats. So if you decide to build a stream processing layer, and you need to consume all these different formats, how do you even do that, right? You have all those different message formats coming to you, so it's not really straightforward. And we already uh, decided it's probably not a good idea to expose this in the topic uh, name itself, right? So a very simple solution, oh, and by the way, uh, it's really hard to even uh, understand how to deserialize data. This is a very simple Java snippet for Kafka custom deserializer. So you get this byte array of data, and you have no idea if it's JSON or Protobuf or something else. Uh, so how do you even try to deserialize it? Do you just try one format and then fall back to another? It's going to be really inefficient. So a very simple trick uh, you can use is a message envelope. Right? So you still have uh, your um, domain event, your payload that was originally produced uh, available. Right? You just don't really care what is it. Is it a Protobuf or JSON or something else? You just treat it as a byte array. And you have this nice envelope with a bunch of additional metadata fields and additional headers that you use to actually route, uh, filter, and monitor all these different data streams. And in this case, your stream processing layer, it doesn't really need to deserialize all these different message formats. 
uh, because you can, you can just ac access all these headers and all these metadata fields right here, right in the envelope. So you don't need to decentralize the actual business, uh, business event. Uh, we designed uh, such envelope uh, using Protobuf 2, and this is a very simplified uh, version of it. So you can see a bunch of different uh, metadata fields and headers that we use for monitoring, filtering, and routing. Uh, we also have a message ID, which is really important, because if you have a unique message ID for every single message in your pipeline, you can achieve efficiently once delivery, uh, which means at least once a plus deduplication on that message ID. So it's really important to have it. And as you can see, the actual message payload here at the bottom is just a bytes array, right? So we don't even know what's inside. And we don't care, as I said, because in this stream processing layer, uh, we just monitor, filter, and route data, maybe doing some lightweight uh, validation. But when it reaches the ETL job, uh, you actually need to somehow deserialize it. And that's why we also have the schema info object in the envelope. And schema info is a way for you to uh, understand uh, how, do you need, how, how you need to deserialize uh, the message using schema registry. Uh, what is a schema registry? It's actually a pretty simple API to manage man uh, message schemas. It's always a single source of truth for all the producers and consumers, and it should be pretty much impossible for anyone to send a message to the pipeline without registering its schema first in the schema registry. And I believe that good schema registry supports immutability of schemas, uh, versioning, uh, and some basic validation. Uh, and in Activision, we actually built a custom schema registry using Python and Cassandra. So as a summary, I want to say that um, assuming we implement all these changes, uh, now adding new game, launching new game, should be, in theory, as simple as just producing new data, right? So as a producer, just start producing uh, new data for, for the new game, and that's it. And uh, because we use the unified message envelope and unified topic naming convention, uh, from our case, uh, from the data platform games, uh, data platform perspective, we don't really need to do much. And uh, it's possible because of this operational uh, stream processing layer. But it's still flexible enough. Uh, we have various, uh, various producers, and they can still use their own uh, message formats if they prefer to, maybe because of performance reasons or something else. Uh, and it's also now easier to extend the pipeline in terms of new use cases, because topic names uh, actually contain precise data types. They don't contain any sort of metadata, and no producer names, nothing like that. So very precise data type. And uh, stream processing and filtering allows low-cost experiments, all kinds of A-B testing. And you can also build a data catalog on top of schema registry uh, to promote data discovery in your organization. Um, and that's it for today. Thank you.